welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. We're continuing our discussion of westward expansion in the decades leading up to the Civil War. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about James K. Polk and the Mexican War. James K. Polk was a politician from Tennessee, sometimes called Young Hickory, because he reminded so many of his mentor, Andrew Jackson, who of course was nicknamed Old Hickory. Polk shared many of Jackson's perspectives, including his disregard for Native American rights, and he was aggressively expansionist in American policy. After winning the presidential election in 1844, he set about to obtain vast territory to expand the United States, starting with Oregon, which had been one of his campaign promises. In fact, Polk had famously campaigned with the slogan, 5440 or fight, a reference to the latitude that Polk demanded from Britain for the um, border with British Canada. Ultimately, he settled on a, a more southern boundary than that at the 49th parallel, but that did resolve the border dispute with Canada and freed up Polk and the United States to focus their attentions on the Southwest and what would become war with Mexico. So even after the annexation of Texas, uh, Texas was not entirely out of the picture when it came to these kind of international disputes. In fact, the southern border between Texas and Mexico was disputed even after the Mexican War. The Mexicans viewed the border as the Nueces River, here a little bit further to the north, and America argued for the southern border at the Rio Grande River, which would have given the United States all of this disputed territory in the middle. Polk sent John Slidell to Mexico to negotiate that southern boundary. He also sent General Zachary Taylor into the disputed territory to defend that territory as if it were United States territory. Ultimately, Slidell was rejected by the Mexicans, so there would be no peaceful negotiation of that boundary. In a very aggressive and frankly illegal move, Taylor moved his army all the way up to the Rio Grande River in that disputed territory. The Mexicans had a good army and were confident, but were not eager for war. But with Taylor's men just across the river, the Mexicans were provoked into attacking. Polk immediately declared war, and the Mexican War had started. Polk declared, Mexico has invaded our territory and shed American blood upon American soil. Many Americans were opposed to the war, and particularly the way that it was begun. Abraham Lincoln, who was a young congressman from Illinois, called for Polk to point out the spot on American soil where American blood had been shed. And Henry David Thoreau spent a night in jail in opposition to the war and wrote his classic civil disobedience about the right to protest about this war. The war sent a rift down through both of the American political parties, the Democratic and Whig parties, as they both divided more or less along sectional and geographic lines. Southerners from both parties supporting the war because they envisioned that it would extend uh, slave-controlled territory, and Northerners of both parties typically opposing the war for exactly those reasons, but also the, the kind of moral question around the war that Thoreau and Lincoln pointed out. The war itself was gruesome, and while it was fairly one-sided and the Mexicans were overmatched. They did put up a tough fight, um, but getting no international support, they ultimately were no match for the American army. Still, the combat itself was very difficult, and the soldiers who were involved in the war would not have thought that it was an easy enterprise. As one young lieutenant wrote home in a letter to his wife, I had no idea until a few days passed what horrible sights a battlefield presented. The road and its vicinity on both sides, for most of three miles, were covered with the dead and dying, 
bodies without heads, arms, legs, and disfigured in every possible way. Oh, it was awful, and I can never forget this day. The war also provided combat experience for a generation of soldiers and ultimately leaders and generals who would feature prominently a decade and a half later in the Civil War. I've mentioned already Zachary Taylor, who was the ranking general. Nicknamed Old Rough and Ready, Taylor earned a reputation for bravery and was a soldier's soldier. Uh, ultimately, his fame from this war would catapult him all the way to the White House. But many other Americans gained experience in this war as well. Winfield Scott, who was nicknamed Old Fuss and Feathers, uh, gained experience here and would head into the Civil War as one of the most prominent generals. Others serving in the Mexican War included Ulysses S. Grant, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and George Meade, among many others. After about five months of difficult fighting, the Mexicans were forced to surrender and to sign the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. This treaty settled the southern border of Texas, obviously in favor of the Americans and Texas, and also ceded a huge amount of territory that becomes the American Southwest in the aftermath of this war. 500,000 or so square miles, about half of Mexico's territory, including all or part of what is today California, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, Utah, Colorado, and Nevada. Some might ask, with such a resounding victory for the United States, why did we not simply take all of Mexico? Well, recall some of the comments I mentioned leading up to the war. There were many in the United States who weren't interested in taking all of Mexico. They were interested really only in the arable parts that were good for growing crops and for the extension of slavery, but they weren't interested in assuming the greater population of Mexico into the United States. The Mexican War was a new sort of war for a number of reasons. This is the first war that is covered by correspondence and reported to the people on an almost daily basis. The telegraph allows for the virtually instantaneous transfer of messages and information and news. And so Americans were getting steady reports from the battlefront and almost day by day understanding how the war was progressing. This war was also revolutionary for the images associated with it. On the one hand, it's the first war for which we have an early form of photography called daguerreotypes. And Americans were captivated by being able to see these images from war. Now, still shots and kind of posed photographs like this were reasonably good quality and focus, but action shots from the field of battle were in some cases almost unintelligible. Also derived from this war were many lithographs, that is, paintings and pict reproducible pictures that were made uh, depicting various aspects of the war, battles, and uh, some of the heroes of the war. And again, Americans were drawn to these kind of images enthusiastically. So let's talk about some of the results and outcomes from this war. Well, I've already described the territorial gain that came about as a result of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Hidalgo. Uh, in which the United States gained roughly half of Mexico's territory and um, Mexico conceded the border of Texas at the Rio Grande. The United States, by the way, paid about $15 million for uh, this territory and for damages from the war. I also described a little bit about the field experience uh, that many uh, officers gained and that would play a role later in the Civil War. The Mexican War also led to strained relations between the United States and Latin America, and of course, particularly Mexico. Um, and the Mexicans were very angry uh, with the outcome of this war, angry at the United States, and that 
uh, frustration lingered for many, many years and in some ways lingers even to this day. In terms of uh, mortality, there were about 1,700 Americans killed uh, in this war and another 11,500 or so died of disease. Uh, I mentioned again the conditions in the war were uh, really difficult and disease ran rampant at times. Uh, and about 50,000 Mexicans were killed in the war. Perhaps the most significant outcome from the perspective of the United States moving forward was the pressing question of what would happen to the territory that had been obtained in the aftermath of this war. And specifically, would slavery expand into those territories as they organized and became states? That is a question that we will discuss more thoroughly in the next lecture and that ultimately will lead us directly to the Civil War.